Hey everybody, welcome to Talk Gnosis. We have returning to the show multiple time guest, uh, the Greg Kaminsky, uh, fellow occult podcaster, uh, occult podcaster, uh, OG, uh, one of the, the first important uh, occult podcasts, in, in my opinion, and uh, really pumped to talk about his new book. Hello, Greg. Hello, Jonathan. Wonderful <laughs> to speak with you again. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's really awesome having you back, Greg. And we're going to talk about your your new, your old new book, uh, a book that's been with you for a long time now, I guess. Uh, Celestial Intelligences, uh, Angel, <laughs> Angelology. I can't speak. Why, why am I a podcaster? Why do I have a YouTube <laughs> show? Okay, look, I'm going to do this again. I'm not going to edit this. Everybody, buy Greg's new book, Celestial Intelligences. <laughs> Angelology, Kabbalah, Gnosis, Giovanni Pico, Della Mer uh, Mirandola's Quest for the Perennial Philosophy. Oh, man, there we go. Greg is holding it up for everybody who is uh, watching the YouTube version. And I'm going to, we're going to do plugs at the end, but I'm flashing where you should, where you can buy it. You should go buy it. But before you go buy the book, uh, give us money at patreon.com slash Gnostic. How's that for a transition? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we need your financial support to do the show. I wish it wasn't that way. I, I wish that the, the angels would descend from the heavens and uh, just give us the funds to, to do this once or twice a week. But for as little as a dollar per piece of media, you can keep the show going over at patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can put a cap on that if you're scared. We're going to do a lot of media. We usually bill for about five or six. We try to do a lot more than that per month. We're always trying to do new shows you can do one-time donations at paypal.com slash gnostic and if you're unable to help us out financially we completely understand uh you can tell people about the show you can share it on social media you can like rate and subscribe on both youtube and on the podcast uh software of your choice greg uh i guess can you give us sort of the elevator pitch, sort of the broad overview of, of who Pico was, uh, I guess, uh, his, his biography? And I know that's a big question to open up with, but if you can give us uh, sort of that, that bird's eye view of him. Sure. So Giovanni Pico del Mirandolo was a, a Renaissance philosopher. He was uh, born near Moderna, Italy of a noble family and he was considered a child prodigy and by age 14 he could read and write and speak at least six languages and was sent off to university to study canon law um, so obviously his intellect was really quite powerful um, and he became interested in religion, in mysticism, in methods for human beings to attain a union with the divine while they were still alive. And that was a really heretical idea in that context in which he lived um now the way that he became interested in this is interesting because uh, the spanish inquisition was going on during this time in the late 1400s when he lived the mid to late 1400s and some converted Kabbalists from Spain had moved to Italy and he employed a couple of these gentlemen as his translators and tutors. So he learned Hebrew, he learned the Kabbalah, but he learned it in a form that uh, was from Christian converts. So in Pico's Kabbalah, the teachings were secret and they also what he how he expressed it they verified the veracity of the christian religion and so pico had this notion where he wanted to be able to apprehend all of creation at once because he he understood on some level that all is not separate. 
that there is an inherent unity, not only in our mind, but in reality. And he, he thought that if he could apprehend this unity from an intellectual or philosophical perspective, that it would provide an avenue for an actual spiritual ascent. And um, it's, that's not really without basis. So he set out on this quest and he, the way he did it was he, he wanted to look at all the relevant religious and philosophical systems at the time, which were in many ways more numerous than we have today because they, they were, they had much more of a knowledge and appreciation of the religions and philosophies of the ancient world. I think certainly Pico did. And so he collected and then started sifting through all of this information and trying to pull out, tease out all of the valid truths of each. And this resulted in 900 theses that he formulated. And he had these printed up. And the idea was that he was going to debate these 900 theses at the Vatican in front of the church fathers and the Pope. And he would debate anyone who was willing to debate him. In fact, he offered to pay the travel expenses of anyone wishing to come to Rome to engage in this debate. And on some level, I believe that and, and it's not just me that believes this. I think other scholars have looked at this and also think that Pico in his mind had some notion that this debate of his 900 thesis would be the event which allowed for his spiritual ascension. Mm -hmm. But that never happened because as soon as the authority, the religious authorities read his book, um, and then they called him in for meetings because um, I think they they decided around 13 of his theses were heretical. And at the top of the list were the ones that said um, the Jewish Kabbalah is, proves the veracity of the Christian faith and that natural magic is also a valid method to know the divine. And so they excommunicated Pico, they banned his book, they threatened uh, excommunication of anyone caught with it, but copies survived and Pico fled Rome after this, um, concerned for his safety. But he was captured on the road to Paris and Lorenzo de' Medici of Florence uh, basically agreed that if, if Pico were placed in his care, that uh, Pico would not be a problem for the authorities any longer. So the Pope agreed, of course, because Lorenzo was more powerful than he was. And Pico publicly sort of adopted a more conservative stance and explored things that were more nominally, you know, religious themes like the Bible, the book of Genesis, um, Plato and Aristotle and, and things of that nature. So, and there's this idea that, um, you know, Pico had moderated his views and kind of become a pious Christian and was no longer this wild heretic. But if you look at his later works, I don't really believe that's the case. He never really moderated his views. He just became skilled at embedding them in his work so that only others with that knowledge would be able to even see it. And then um, when the Medici's power waned, and I think the French were at the, the gates of Florence, uh, Pico was assassinated by his secretary, 
Um, so he, he was, he died at age 31. And although he never actually joined that he was buried in the habit of the Dominican order for a number of reasons. And so this was part of the public cover up of Pico's identity, ultimately. Yeah. Uh, why, uh, was, why he was he assassinated by somebody, somebody so close to him? Um, well, because his protector was, was gone. So his, he had no more protection, basically. <laughs> and he was dangerous uh, because he was very intelligent and outspoken and a public figure. And, and he had a lot of enemies, including, I think, uh, Savonarola, the famous friar of the bonfire of the vanities fame. Um, so I think there's, uh, obviously there's, there's a lot to unpack there. There's uh, a lot to talk about. I know there's people listening at home just waiting for us to pull on some threads, but before we, we get to there, uh, at the top of the show, I mentioned that in some ways this is a new old book or a book that's been with you for a long time. Can you tell us about the origins of, of the book and what motivated you to write it and what uh, drew you to Pico? Sure. So this book. Uh, was originally my master's thesis for um, my degree at Harvard. And I was, I had to write a proposal before I even wrote the thesis. So the original proposal was for a book or a text that was exploring how Jewish Kabbalah came to be the basis of Western esotericism. Because that question had kind of bothered me for many, many years. It didn't really make any sense that Christians would so readily adopt this tradition from people they basically hated and looked down on. So I couldn't really figure out how in the world that happened. Um, so I wanted to, to learn about that. So... Um, this whole thesis process at Harvard is pretty involved. And so the first step, my, my, the thesis director at that point, he accepted my proposal. And then we had to go find the, the professor that would actually work with me on the thesis. So I knew I wanted to work with um, Dr. Kimberly Patton. She's the head of comparative religion at Harvard Divinity School. And I'd taken a couple of classes with her, one on angels and one on initiation in the mysteries of ancient Greece. So I was profoundly impressed with her skills and experience and intellect and I I knew that she was the person who would really be able to help me with this. But when we sat down to talk, she was basically like, there's no way I'm going to work with you on this. And I said, okay, is there a particular reason? And she said, your scope is out of control. Like you don't, you actually don't really have a scope. It's too broad. And I don't think you're going to successfully be able to do this in the time allotted and in the space allotted. She's like, you're talking about thousands of pages to explore this. And she's like, I don't want to read more than 200, to be honest. She said, you need to, to tighten your focus considerably. And she said, and the only way that I'm willing to work with you is if angels are the main subject of your exploration. And so I said, okay, that, that's fine with me. And so we looked through my proposal and she said, well, this, this Pico guy seems interesting and he wrote about angels. What about him? I said, that'd be perfect, actually. He's the, the main impetus behind the whole thing. She said, well, great, so let's do that. So I wrote another proposal based on using Pico and his statements about angels in his oration. And just as an aside, this oration, which is known as the Oration on the Dignity of Man, was Pico's 
answer to the authorities' objections to his work. Um, it was contained in a larger work that was termed an apologia, but it's really not. It's more of a justification or a rationale. And it's known as a declaration of Renaissance humanism, but in reality, it's more of a declaration of the perennial philosophy. And so in this oration, Pico talks about how man should not be content being second mm -hmm. to the angels, mm -hmm. that we can equal them and even surpass them in being close to the divine. And we can do this while alive. And he talked about the way to actually do this is to emulate the activity of the angels. So he called out specific angelic orders. And he said, if we emulate what they do, we can become like what they are. And so he explores this idea. And in his 900 thesis, he actually reorders the traditional order of angels, placing cherubim at the top closest to God. And this is really what my thesis is about because his reordering of the angels is actually a key to understanding that humans have a capability if we apply ourselves to actually know the divine but that takes work and discipline and commitment which he outlines um and and it was really interesting to me, like throughout working on this project to explore the way in which Pico's prescription exactly matches that of the Hebrew masters, the Kabbalist masters that, that lived centuries later and, you know, thousands of miles away and probably never heard of Pico or his Christianized Kabbalah because I think they would have laughed at that. But um, nevertheless, it turns out that he's saying the exact same things that they were saying. So valid in that respect. So it's really interesting. And I try to explain Pico's rationale, the way he lays it out and how one could make methods out of this, make a path out of this if one were so inclined. And I don't really recommend that people do that, but in Western esotericism, you know, we often kind of go off on our own and do the things we think we're supposed to do without a lot of guidance. So this is no different. <laughs> well, can you uh, tell us about that path that he lays out? Can you tell us about his recommended methods? Could you tell us about how he thought that the people can emulate the angels, how they can ascend? Sure. Well, he doesn't really lay out the specific methods, but he does lay out the path in broad strokes and using the angelic orders as the guide. So he says, first, we must emulate the cherubim, and these are the angels associated with intelligence. And so he says, if we emulate the cherubim, we will learn philosophy, meaning we will learn who and what we are and what the world is and the relationship between those two. And he said, once we understand that, only then would we even be capable of, of understanding what the divine actually is. And then once we understand what the divine actually is, then we can act with correct judgment and right action in the world so really that's the prescription and it's again is very broad it doesn't give you specific methods to practice every day but you can kind of extrapolate so when one learns about oneself this is you know the the eternal know thyself quest um that involves a giving up of what we typically desire, a purification for all the ways that we've acted 
ignorantly. And then it involves the, the willingness to kind of um, do the things that are necessary, which is like discipline, focusing our thoughts and sacrificing our attention from what we desire onto what we long for. And then as one goes through that process, the divine will inevitably reveal itself. And then once that happens, then one has to have the courage to act from that vision. And that's actually the most difficult part because otherwise we always fall back into our normal, typical way of being, which is not union with the divine, obviously, or we wouldn't even need to have this conversation. I wouldn't have needed to write the book, none of it, but here we are and we need all of these things. And so Pico is describing classic spiritual path um, that would allow one to know themselves, know the world, know the divine, and then act as if they actually know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you said something really interesting when discussing his, his biography, where he thought that if he got a chance to debate his 900 theses, that this would be a spiritual act, that this would this would aid in his ascension. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about that and, and kind of talk about, even though you did lay it out, the what I see is sort of practicing philosophy. Is, is, is that right? Is, is that what yeah. he's, he's recommending that people do, like sort of a, in a really classical Greek sense, uh, Greco-Roman sense? Yeah, that's the first step. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's the first step in knowing thyself, you know, but he also talks about these other aspects, um, you know, all things in moderation. Right. And then the idea that, well, it's expressed as something like thou art that, but that it's not two and saying it's one kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth. And so there's all of these aspects. And so I think in his wanting to debate his theses, what he saw was the spiritual path encompasses a journey. And that journey goes from ignorance to knowledge and then if one is successful to wisdom. But those three are not at all the same. Ignorance, knowledge, and wisdom. So one, one goes from ignorance to knowledge by learning about things. And, and it involves an ever more increasing breaking down of things into ever smaller, more discrete bits so that we can learn the information and the data about each aspect and each part of the thing. But then the journey from knowledge to wisdom involves a unknowing of thingness altogether, which means you can't want, you can't be involved in like the minutia of each discrete little bit as a separate part and you have to be involved in the apprehension of the totality and the totality means there's no separate things right it's a continuum it's divinity and so that journey from knowledge to wisdom involves a sort of an unknowing and an unlearning of thingness. Um, like Marguerite Perret said, this idea of like, I am no thingness, right? She says, thingness is the problem. Like thingness is identity. Thingness is what prevents us from being one with the divine. And so this sort of 
ability to see the unity of all creation, express that, and, and to know it as its parts and to know it as its whole simultaneously. And that means we also know ourselves as part and whole simultaneously. So Pico understood this, I'm sure. And so I think he believed that if he could publicly pull this off, that it, it would not only be a philosophical, mm -hmm. but a spiritual triumph. Yeah. So could you succeed in your quest for the origins of Kabbalah getting into Western esotericism? What Was it primarily Pico? C could you talk about his influence on Christian Kabbalah, on esoteric Kabbalah, and, and why he was drawn to Kabbalah, why he used it, why he incorporated it, why he was inspired by it? Those are good questions. So at the time, you have to understand when we think back in the 1400s, um, all of the esoteric systems of Egypt, of Greece, of Persia, they're dead, right? The priests are dead, the temples are destroyed, there's nothing left but ruins. And they're not monotheistic anyway, so it's not like we could use that. Or at the time, these Christian philosophers could use that. But Judaism has an esoteric system, and the Jews are practicing it now, and it seems to produce results. And Moses was a monotheist, so there's no problem. So basically, they, they felt like, yes, it's Jewish, but... You know, Jesus, you know, Christ came out of Judaism. So we're just going to take this esoteric system. It proves Christianity is true anyway, so we can use it. And then, you know, Pico was the first. He wrote this 900 Theses, declaring this publicly. He, he wrote his oration, also declaring it publicly. While the 900 Thesis was banned, the oration was wildly popular and disseminated like crazy. So, and then you had men like uh, Johann Reuschlin, who came from Germany, studied with Pico, went back and taught Hebrew and Kabbalah in Germany. In fact, he started a movement there called Christian Hebraism, where I've read that when Reuschlin lectured on Hebrew, there'd be it'd be standing room only in the lecture hall, and you'd have a line out the door, like hundreds of people waiting to get in. And these are not Jews. And this is a time when anti-Semitism's pretty rampant. I mean, not, we're not just talking about some nasty graffiti here. So yeah, it's fascinating. And then you had uh, people like uh, Cornelius Agrippa, who wrote his three books of occult philosophy. And the third book was mostly devoted to Kabbalah and angels. And, and that's, again, he's also a student of Pico. So you can see the influence of Pico and his Christian Kabbalah almost immediately disseminating as the basis of Western esotericism. And from there, it's really interesting because they, they took the Kabbalah, but they didn't take Pico's path. They're not doing what Pico described, this sort of mystical path of union with the divine. Right from Agrippa, you see they're taking a path of magic as what I would call more more sorcery in terms of like changing mundane circumstances mostly. And and even theurgy, engaging in theurgy to sort of affect worldly circumstances as well. 
you know, certainly with the eye towards, you know, what is better than not, nevertheless, uh, that is not at all what Pico was talking about. Um, so I, I think that's really interesting because in the West, you don't, you, you see like glimpses of this path that, you know, Pico described. You see it in the alchemical tradition occasionally. Um, you'll see it crop up in the, in the Rosicrucians a little bit. Um, but then you, you don't really see it again until like Gurdjieff. And, uh, and even now today, you know, you're hard pressed to find that sort of thing. So I hope this book will allow people to understand that the original revival of Western esotericism did not involve any joining any esoteric order. It doesn't involve degrees or ritual and it actually works. So I hope people can take away from this book that there is an actual spiritual path, but it doesn't involve accumulating power and prestige and stuff. In fact, it's more of a path of giving everything away and getting nothing in return. Yeah. Can you tell us about what he understood or meant by natural magic? Why it was so controversial? Why that was one of the major um, issues that the the heresy hunters had with him? Uh, and I mean, you you already sort of touched on it uh, just now. But the, 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 how does he use this phrase that's perhaps different than what what people or occultists uh, might mean or might be doing with their rituals and their work? Yeah, it's interesting because he he's Pico is decidedly against divination, astrology, and things of that nature. Um, to him, natural magic is really. Um, using sort of esoteric symbol and correspondences and contemplation of these as a method to arrive at realizations that are divine. So I don't think it would necessarily agree with our like modern conception or definitions of what a magical act looks like but to anyone who's done what i'm talking about you know the inherent magic of it because through like simple act of speaking visualizing and contemplating it's possible to completely alter one's experience and meaning and if that's not real magic, I don't know what is. Yeah. Um, the subtitle for your book has uh, uh, Pico's quest for the perennial philosophy. What is th this idea of the perennial philosophy? Why did he go on a quest for it? You know, what did he understand as the perennial philosophy? Well, I think what Pico understood is the same thing we understand, that there is a basis in humans, in, a, in the human mind and the human experience, a basis for religion and a spiritual path. And that basis is no different for us than it was for people in the past, regardless of gender, culture, place, time, whatever. And that basis is divinity. And I think that the quest is to recognize the inherent sameness of the ground from which all of this arises. And, and so in Pico's philosophy, there's no innovation. There's nothing new. You know, he's pointing back to the always already is as the case um you know so 
you know, in, in some traditions, you might hear this referred to as the ground of all being or, or the basis, you know, or, you know, in, it depends what the tradition, but, you know, it's a, it's like a substanceless, placeless, timeless reality um, that is more true than we are, but we have access to perceive it and to be it, provided we do the work necessary. Um, the oration on the dignity of man, I think perhaps some people who don't know Pico's work or this is their introduction to it more or less, that might be itching at the back of their head because I feel like it pops up even in, in high school courses uh, on world history when they touch on the Renaissance. Can you tell us a bit more about this work and its influence and perhaps how it might be misunderstood since maybe people aren't reading it, understanding about Pico's mystical leanings? Yeah, I think, I think, I could be wrong, but I think what happens is people read like the first page or two and they get, I don't know what you'd call it, this sort of glamour uh, strikes them and they, they read that, you know, man is the penultimate, like humans are the ultimate in creation because we can become whatever we put our minds to. But if you read even a little bit further, it's clear that Pico's not saying that humans are the ultimate because they inherently are. He's saying they're the ultimate because humans have the capability to be the same or be the divine because we are already participating in that because all of this is already that so it really is a matter of cleansing our perception to, to be able to perceive that so so i think many people just assume because of his statements about humans and their capabilities that this is really saying that humans can somehow make their own meaning in the world, which is not what he's saying. And that that's not even true or possible. So that's not it. Really, really what he's declaring is that the perennial philosophy is real and valid and that that's what we should be concerned with. But, but again, the same way they hijack Pico's legacy they hijack this oration in the same exact way. I mean, it's all part and parcel of the same propaganda operation, essentially, is to cast Pico as this pious Christian who ushered in the era of humans instead of the divine at the top of the ladder. But no, that's really not the case. Um, they whitewashed Pico and they whitewashed his oration. So for anyone who reads it, I, I would say, don't stop after the first page, you know, read the whole thing and think about it. Think about what he's saying there, because this was a, this was a brash young man who was ready and willing to sacrifice himself as in his future to declare the truth. Well, I think that's uh, the perfect place to, to start wrapping up. But uh, of course, before we do, can you tell people uh, where they can get the book? Sure. You can order the book directly from Anathema Publishing Limited. I believe we got the links there for you. Um, there's at least two editions, a standard and a collector's edition available. Um, and... You know, those are those are really nice additions. Joseph Uccello did all the artwork, the layout, and the design for the whole book. It's tremendous, and uh, I'm I'm really really happy with it. I, I'm thrilled that Anathema published it, and Joseph did all the work on it. And uh, I hope people enjoy it. And uh, 
And if you want to talk to me about it or have questions, you can always get in touch with me. My email is uh, brothergreg at protonmail.com. And uh, I always like to hear from people. So I hope I do. Fantastic. Greg, uh, as always, a pleasure and an honor to, to have you on the show. And uh, thanks so much for coming on and uh, sharing this awesome wisdom. And I, as I was saying before we started recording, I haven't gotten my copy yet, but I, I can't wait. So thank you, yeah. Jonathan. It's really wonderful. I thank you for again for the opportunity to, to talk with you and discuss this work. And uh, I wish you all the best. Thanks. And look forward to next time. <laughs> yeah, can't wait. Bye. Bye bye.